Um, assuming you brought your books, open to, make sure I'm looking at the right one, 11th edition, uh, page 332. <clears throat> and I think we left off the other day, just at the, uh, the end of that first long paragraph. Okay. Talked about him walking in, nodding to people, you know, um, how disturbed the people, yes? You know what page it is in in the 10th edition, it's a, it is, it's a couple. Mm -hmm. I thought we wrote it down on my It is 331, I think? Nope. 3, 389. I'll work this weekend on, because I know several people are using the 10th edition, on going through the syllabus, and I'll put my 10th and put all the page numbers for the 10th edition on, uh, on it, and I'll upload a new one. Um, so that first long paragraph, I want to pick up with... Um, a little bit past the middle of that paragraph, where it says, it's talking about the, um, the old guy, the oldest member of the congregation who's sitting in a, in a chair in the center of the aisle, and he doesn't really notice kind of what's going on, or he doesn't notice how people are reacting to Parson Hooper because he hasn't noticed the veil of Parson Hooper's face. So Hooper walks up, and we're told this. And it's, I don't know, about seven or eight lines up from the end of the paragraph. He seemed to not fully to partake of the prevailing wonder till Mr. Hooper had ascended the stairs and showed himself in the pulpit, face to face with his congregation, except for the black veil. Okay, so showed himself face to face like I am to you, Notice, except for the black veil. So not face-to-face -face metaphorically in that he's facing in their direction, but they can't see his face. That mysterious emblem was never once withdrawn. And I think we finished, I might be confusing you with my second class, I think we finished talking about mysterious emblem. And I, I talked the other day, you know, a mystery... <laughs> Literally, is something that is unsolvable. It's inexplicable. You, you cannot rationalize it. You cannot uh, understand it rationally. Okay? <clears throat> it, it's not a whodunit. A whodunit is somebody does something at the beginning of a story or novel or film or whatever, and it's up to the main character to figure out who done it, and they do. Okay, that is easily solvable. So this mysterious emblem, and I drew that, okay, because it's an emblem. It indicates something. You see this on a jersey. What is it automatically telling you? Nike. Nike either made that or Nike is a sponsor. Why Nike? Goes back to Greek mythology, goddess of victory. So, you know, when um, Phil, I lived in Oregon shortly after he founded Nike. When Phil, what's his name, founded Nike, you know, he's pretty smart with coming up with that as the name of the company. It's kind of like, buy our stuff and you'll be victorious. Okay? So, this mysterious emblem. But what is an emblem? An emblem is an image, okay, that's designed to convey an idea. <laughs> All right? You go back to um, 
before the advent of printed books. So before about mid 1450s, right? When all the books were written by hand and when you had people making books, I mean, you had all manuscripts made by hand, but you also had people making books out of what are called woodcuts. So you have a carver, carve an image on a piece of wood, and then that wood gets inked. Put a piece of paper on it, put a platen over it, you take the paper off, and you have an image. And they had books of these kinds of images. They're called emblem books, okay? And those images usually were biblical stories. It was a way to tell stories of the Bible without an audience that could read, okay? So the emblems there were usually inculcating some kind of moral message, some kind of theological, you know, precept and such. But this is a mysterious emblem. Now, if an emblem, like a parable, remember we talked about that the other day, if an emblem like a parable is supposed to convey an idea, and yet this one is mysterious, then what idea is it conveying? They don't understand. Right? Hooper understands, but does he ever come right out and say, I'm wearing this black veil because... No, he doesn't. It's up to them to figure it out. That is why it's a parable. He who has ears to hear, he who has eyes to see, let him hear, let him see kind of a thing. Okay? So, that mysterious emblem was never once withdrawn. It shook with his measured breath as he gave out red, the psalm. It threw its obscurity... The skewer part there relates to sight, vision, seeing things openly, but it's obscure. It's bent vision, bent sight. It's not clear. It's like, to use St. Paul's term or phrase, seeing through a glass darkly, through dark lenses, filters some stuff out, okay? Right? It threw its obscurity between him and the holy page, the Bible, as he read the scriptures. And while he prayed, the veil lay heavily on his uplifted countenance. Notice, he's not praying like this, like a lot of modern Protestants do. He's praying probably with his hands like this and his face up, looking upwards. Okay? Did he seek to hide it from the dread being whom he was addressing? That's the narrator saying, is he trying to hide his face from God? Okay, in one sense, that's a very silly question, right? If one believes in God, or if one even accepts the notion of God, then what good is a little piece of fabric going to do to hide you from God? No good at all. So if he was trying to hide his face from God, uh, he's a fool. Okay. Such was the effect of this simple piece of crepe that more than one woman of delicate nerves was forced to leave the meeting house. She was, <laughs> and somebody had to help her out. Okay. Why? Because he's wearing a simple piece of black cloth over his face. Yet perhaps the pale-faced congregation was almost as fearful a sight to the minister as his black veil to them. Why does Hawthorne describe the congregation as pale-faced? They're scared. They're scared. What, what does pale mean? Lack of color. Lack of color. They don't have anything over their faces. That's why they're pale-faced. It doesn't mean the all-white congregation. Though, in the mid-1750s, the odds are very, very great that in New England, they would be an all-white congregation. You know, like Vermont and New Hampshire are two of the whitest states you know, in the country. Okay? Massachusetts, etc. So, maybe... His looking out there was as fearful to him 
that is, seeing their uncovered faces, was as frightful to him as their seeing his covered face. Hmm. He had the reputation, we're not going to read it entirely, but there are large passages of the world. He had the reputation of a good preacher, but not an energetic one. In other words, you know, he got the point across, but he wasn't a fire and brimstone. He wasn't a, you know, a Billy Graham type who had people falling on their faces, convicted of sin, blah, blah, blah. No. He strove to win his people heavenward, that is to God, by mild persuasive influences rather than to drive them thither by the thunders of the word. Now, a preacher who lived a little bit before the time that Hawthorne alludes to in that note, when he talks about, you know, about 80 years ago, there was a guy who did something similar to this. Okay? So there was a preacher who lived prior to the 1750s, his name was Jonathan. Total derailment of thought. Who wrote a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards? Yeah, I think it's Jonathan Edwards. I don't know why I'm forgetting that. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he uses this image of God holding people over the gaping mouth of hell by a single thread, dangling them. Why? Because they deserve punishment. I mean, he was a really, really staunch what's called Calvinist, right? <laughs> We're being told Parson Hooper doesn't do that. He doesn't get in there and, you know, turn or burn if you don't change from... No, he mildly tries to persuade people, Okay. The sermon which he now delivered, marked by the same characteristics of style and manner as most of his. But there was something, either in the sentiment, okay, think of you know those, those terms about literature, about fiction, the sentiment's kind of in the tone of it. His attitude towards what he's delivering, okay, or either in the sentiment of the discourse itself, or in the imagination of the auditors, in the, their minds, what they're hearing, right? which made it greatly the most powerful effort that they had ever heard from their pastor's lips. So maybe he wrote it in such a way that he's conveying this attitude, or notice the narrator tells us, it's one or the other, or it's entirely in their imaginations, that they're like, this is the greatest sermon Parson Hooper has ever delivered. The subject had reference to secret sin. And those sad mysteries which we hide from our nearest and dearest, and would fain, that is desire, conceal from our own consciousness, even forgetting that the omniscient all knowing okay, can detect them. So we get this buildup to oh, what's the topic of the sermon? Secret sin. And notice what goes on. Those sad mysteries, there's that word again, that we hide from our nearest and dearest, the people we love the most, those that are closest to us. The narrator is saying, we all do that. There are certain things that we don't tell anybody. Okay? And that we even try to hide from God. And from ourselves. Okay? From our own consciousness. What would this, how would a psychologist deal with that? What would a psychologist say? About that line, the individual is trying to do one word, repress. Push it down. You don't let it come up to bother. Just, just ignore it. What do people sometimes do when they have, when they experience something so traumatic, or when they experience something traumatic and horrible? They bury it. Okay? 
That's why PTSD can come not just immediately after something happens. It can come years later because the thing has been repressed and it bursts out. All right? That's why psychologists, therapists, etc., will say, you got to deal with the problem now. If you don't deal with it now, you'll deal with it later. If you deal with it later, what's it? Go how's it going to be? It's like if you get a wound and you don't treat it, and the wound kind of scabs over, but you've still got stuff in there, it's going to fester. And when it festers, eventually the wound will pop open and it'll be a whole lot worse than it was. So, a subtle power was breathed into his words. Each member of the congregation, the most innocent girl, the man of heart and breast, felt as if the cre creature, as if the preacher had crept upon them behind his awful veil and discovered the hoarded iniquity of deed or thought. <laughs> So each speaker feels like, or each member of the congregation feels like he comes up behind him and goes, gotcha. I know what you're writing. I know what you, you know, it's like that movie, I know what you did last summer. Okay. I know what you did. Whether the most innocent girl were told, what does that imply? She doesn't have anything to hide. Yes, she does. Or the person of the most hardened breath, the greatest killer, if you want. And notice, discovered their what? Not just their deed or thought. Their hoarded iniquity. What do you do when you hoard something? You like stash it. Keep going. Uh, then you, just, like, you stash like a large amount. And then, like, you're not yeah, you stash a large amount. Why? So save up. It's mine. Okay. It's mine. It's not yours. I'm not going to let anybody else have it. What's being hoarded here, though? Iniquity of deed or thought. Sin. It's like saying, okay, God, I'll confess all of this to you. But this one, uh -uh. this one's mine. Why? Because there's, there's a connection. It's, I want to keep it. That is, I'll stop doing X, Y, and Z. <laughs> but I'm going to still keep doing A through V. <laughs> there was nothing terrible in what he said. Notice. No violence. And yet with every tremor of his melancholy voice, the hearers quaked. Notice the little bit of editorial comment there describing his voice. Melancholy. If somebody is melancholy, what are they? Sad. Sad. We would use the term today, kind of depressed. It's a depressive state of mind. It's looking at the world as a glass half empty, <laughs> rather than half full. So sensible, excuse me, an unsought pathos came hand in hand with awe. Pathos, feeling. So while they're kind of in awe, at what he's saying and how he appears, they're being, to use a very old phrase, cut to the quick. The quick meaning to their life of life inside. It's like, if he keeps going, people are going to start dying. Metaphorically, I don't mean that literally, right? So sensible were the audience of some unwanted attribute. Unwanted. That doesn't mean undesired. It means unusual, un, un, unaccustomed, not something that normally happens, okay? That they long for a breath of wind to blow aside the veil, almost believing that a stranger's visage would be discovered, though the form, gesture, and voice were those of Mr. Hooper. They want to know, or they want to believe, this isn't Parson Hooper. This is somebody else. But everything else about him says it's Parson Hooper. Why do they want that veil to be removed and for them to see that it's Fred Thompson, not, you know, Parson Hooper? Because then they could explain everything away. They could say, oh, I just feel this way because it's a new preacher. And I don't need to worry about all these feelings that I'm feeling right but it's Parson Hooper. He knows me. 
Church service finishes. People head out. Notice, with indecorous confusion. I have the passage on the syllabus about decorum, okay? Proper behavior. Indecorous confusion. You know, usually when it is 8.55 in here, you guys, you know, kind of calmly, quietly, you get up and leave. Indecorous confusion means they're knocking each other over to get out that door. They want to get as far away and as fast from Parson Hooper as they can. Why? They want to go back to feeling like they normally feel. They're, they're so wound up. Eager to communicate their pent-up amazement. And what do they want to do? They want to talk. What the hell is going on? Why is he wearing this? Did you feel? Yeah. Did, did he get into you? Yeah. And conscious of lighter spirits, the moment they lost sight of the black veil. Like, as soon as they're out of the presence of the veils, a weight has been lifted. Okay? It's like if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden, you know, a cop pulls up behind you and just seems to follow you for like five miles. And you go, you know, do I have a taillight out? What is going on? Okay? Some gathered little circles, huddled together, whispering, some go home alone, wrapped in silent meditation. That is, they are thinking. What does it mean? Some talked loudly, profaned the Sabbath day with ostentatious laughter. This is back at a time when you shouldn't laugh on Sundays, just like you shouldn't work on Sundays, because it's the Sabbath day, day of rest, all that kind of stuff. A few shook their sagacious, it means wise, Heads intimating they could penetrate the mystery. In other words, a few kind of implied, oh, I know what he's getting at. The narrator isn't saying they do know what he's getting at. He's saying they imply that. While one or two affirmed that there's no mystery at all. His eyes were bothering him. And he didn't, they didn't have these back then. Bright sun. I not literally, but I'm pretty close. I can't go out on a day like today without sunglasses on. It literally hurts my eyes. Okay, Maybe he's got dust in his eyes or something. Okay. After a brief interval, Hooper comes out. <laughs> Turning his veiled face from one group to another, he pays due reference to the hoary heads, that is, the white-headed people, do reverence, respect your elders. Okay? Salutes the middle age with kind dignity. It doesn't mean, you know, he stands at attention and does this. He just nods towards them. He acknowledges them. Okay? As their friend and spiritual guide, greets the youth with mingled authority and love, puts his hand on the heads of the little children to bless them. Such was always his custom. That is... This is Parson Hooper. This person is doing exactly what he always does. Strange and bewildered looks repaid him for this courtesy. Notice what he's not repaid with. Courtesy. Prompt behavior. None, as on former occasions, Aspire to the honor of walking by him. It's like he comes out, the Red Sea parts. They kind of want to move away. <clears throat> Old Squire Saunders, we're told, neglected to invite Mr. Hooper to his table, where he usually goes every Sunday. Okay? So he goes home. Closes the door, and just before he does, he turns around and looks at everybody. Because what is everybody doing? They're all standing watching him. And we're told, all of whom had their eyes fixed upon him, a sad smile gleamed faintly from beneath the black veil. What is that telling us? See, I, I said the first day, 
when we started talking about this, that the veil comes below his mouth. And then the literal description says it ends just above his mouth. And yet every time we're told he speaks, the veil moves because his breath is blowing it. I think it's got to be clear. The veil come, comes below. So the smile gleams beneath the veil. They can kind of see it. And a lady says, how strange that a simple black veil, such as any woman might wear on her body, should become such a terrible thing on Mr. Hooper's face. Her husband, something's wrong with him. Notice, his intellects, he's gone screwy in his mind. But the strangest part of the affair is the effect of this vagary, even on a sober, you know, I'm, I'm down to earth, I'm rooted, I'm grounded, I'm not one taking the flights of fancy, and this thing has the crap scared out of me, he said. The black veil, though it covers only our pastor's face, throws its influence, that is its effect, over his whole person, and makes him ghost-like. If you're ghost-like, then it's like you're dead. You're, you're not fully there. But what else? How many of you believe in ghosts? You don't have to put your hand up. Let's say for a moment you do believe in ghosts. You believe they're actually real. Everybody in here. And let's say for a moment a ghost suddenly, I'm not going to say it comes through the door, comes through that wall and just kind of hovers between her and these guys, what's your reaction going to be? Run, scared, you know, itless? <laughs> Probably. Unless you're, you know, someone, oh, ghosts are nice. They just want to be understood. And I can help them solve their problems so they can go off to. No. They don't belong here. Just say when we get to Hamlet. Hamlet meets a ghost. And he's kind of like, I need to find out if this ghost is a Good ghost or a bad ghost. Guess what? There are no good ghosts in Hamlet. Ghosts are supposed, you know, when you die, you're supposed to stay dead or be resurrected, you know, kind of a thing, depending upon your religion. So, and her husband says, don't you feel the same? I do. And I would not be alone with him for the world. I wonder he is not afraid to be alone with himself. What? What if, again, that gets back to something has stirred his intellect. She's saying, I wonder if he's not even afraid to be by himself. Why? What? If you know somebody who is, you know, it's National, uh, tomorrow begins, National Suicide Month. Not, sorry, National Suicide Prevention Month. Have to get the right word in there. Um, if you know somebody who is suicidal, what is the one thing you don't do? I mean, really suicidal. Leave them alone. You stay with that person. You take that person somewhere to get help. You be the help. And, and that might just be staying with them. It doesn't mean, you know, preaching Jesus or all, or, you know, it, it just means being with them, showing that person you care. Because usually, someone who commits suicide does it because they don't think anybody gives a rat you know what. And that the world will not even know if they no longer are around. So, there's an afternoon service. And they had a morning service, there's an afternoon service, and there's going to be an evening service. Okay? At its conclusion, the bell tolled for the funeral of a, of a young lady. And that means that's going back to an old British custom that was still used in the United States during this, in the colonies at this time, that when a person died, the church bell tolled, rang, to indicate that somebody's died. And if it's a man who dies, it is rung nine times, boom, 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 nine times, and then a pause, and then it's rung, I think it is once a minute, for every year the person lived. So if the person lived 10 years, 10 year old kid, it's rung for 10 times over 10 minutes. If it's a woman, it's rung eight times, then a pause, then the number of years that person lived, okay? 
So everybody comes, and here comes Parson Hooper and his black veil. And they're going, okay, now this works. This fits. This is appropriate. Why? You don't wear white to a wedding. Uh, excuse me, to a funeral. You do wear white to a wedding. You wear black. It's symbolic of mourning. You'll especially see that when we get to him. So he comes in, and he stoops over the open coffin. So when he stoops over, think of this as the veil. He's got it wrapped around his forehead, like this. He stoops over, and what does it do? It hangs down. So if the dead person can see, the dead person can see his face without the veil over. And we're told, middle of that long paragraph, bottom of 333, could Mr. Hooper be fearful of her glance that he so hastily caught back the black veil? Because when he does realize it shows, he reaches up. A person who watched the interview between the dead and the living affirmed that as soon as the veil kind of opened up face to face of the dead person, the body twitched. Though the countenance retained the composure of death. The superstitious old woman was the only witness. Right? He goes up, he says the funeral prayer, he prays. Second to the last sentence. The people trembled, though they but darkly understood him when he prayed that they and himself and all of mortal race might be ready as he trusted this young woman had been for the dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. Okay. Notice the veil is a symbol. What's the literary Literary definition of a symbol. It has its literal meaning, right? It is a piece of black cloth. It is a veil. Now, this is the first time it's kind of used this way. Now, it's also symbolic. What does that mean? To snatch the veil from their faces. It's a mask. Louder? It's a mask. They're masks. Okay. What's the mask? No. Later, that's going to be one of the meanings. Where is the veil? Really close. What's the veil between? What are they? What are they commemorating here? The dead person, right? It's the point of demarcation between the living and the dead. It's death. When, when that veil is lifted, what happens? For an individual. When that veil is lifted for me, I ain't here anymore. <laughs> the veil is like a door. Read the Harry Potter novels. Read the fourth book, or not fourth book, fifth book, Goblet of Fire. Harry and his friends, they go into a room and there's a veil hanging from an archway. And the veil is gently moving, even though there's no air conditioning and there's no wind in this room. And Harry is drawn to this veil. Okay? The veil is highly symbolic. All right? So... Again, he prays that they and himself and all of mortal race might be ready as he trusts she was for the dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. What does that mean? To be ready to die. We're going to see when we get to Hamlet. Short, eh, I won't say that. Hamlet, in a conversation with a friend, shortly before the close of the play, he says, everybody's got to die. 
Some people might die today. Some people might die tomorrow. If I die today, I won't die tomorrow. If I don't die tomorrow, I'll die today. And he says, the readiness is all. That is, the readiness to die. The being prepared to die. That's what person Hooper is getting at. So why does he say this in a prayer to his congregation? What is he telling each member of the congregation? You too will be in a wood box. You too will be in a wood box. You will be in a wood box. That little five-year-old girl, the innocent one, will be in a wooden box. The old white-haired guy who sits in the middle of the aisle, his time will, everyone will face death, and you got to be prepared, okay? The, the bearers went heavily forth, the mourners followed, and Mr. Hooper follows behind all of them with the veil, okay? And one person says to another, how come you're looking back? He says, because I thought I saw a person who were walking hand in hand with the spirit of the dead girl. I thought the same thing. So later, later on that evening, same day, we have a wedding. The handsomest couple in town. Okay? And everybody's thinking, okay, he won't wear it now. You, you don't wear the colors, the clothes of mourning to a wedding. He comes up and he's wearing it. And we're told, middle of that paragraph, page 334, such was its immediate effect on the guests that a cloud seemed to have rolled duskily, duskily, that's like that gloomy shade, darkly, from beneath the, the black grape, and dim the light of the candles. Well, again, that is playing on an old English idea. And that is, if you go to a wedding in, 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 in an old wedding ceremony, the bride and groom hold candles. And the candles are symbolic of their lives. Okay? And the candles will kind of get joined together at one point. So they're holding their candles and they're going through their vows. And it's always good as long as, you know, the candles are alight. But if a breeze comes through and blows one of the candles out, that's not a good sign. That's a premonition. Okay? That this is going to be a short marriage. Not, you know, because one's divorcing the other, but because one's going to die. So they get this impression that the candles dim. Would you get out of here, you know? You're a downer on this wedding. The bridal pair stood before the minister, but the bride's cold fingers. Should a bride's fingers be cold? Should any living person's fingers be cold? No. Quivered in the tremulous hand of the bridegroom, and notice his hand shaking. You know, getting married's a very stressful event. They're probably both shaking a little bit. Um, and her death-like paleness caused a whisper. Notice, she is pale. She has a death-like paleness. What does death-like mean? I could find the whitest person in this room and say, when you die, guess what? You're going to be even whiter. Why? No blood. At all. You're going to lose what little, you know, color you have. Her death-like paleness caused a whisper that the maiden who had been buried a few hours before was come back from the dead to be married. Okay? So, Mr. Hooper raises a glass of wine to his lips, wishes the happy couple, a, you know, long life. And as he does... He's raising the wine goblet, and he sees his reflection. 
Why is this significant? Why is this emphasized here? What are we being told? Um, he catches a glimpse of his figure in the looking glass of the black veil involved his own spirit in the horror with which it overwhelmed all others. His frame shuddered, his lips grew white. He spilt the untasted wine upon the carpet and rushed forth into the darkness. For the earth, too, had on her black veil. Symbolism. The earth is covered. The sun is not out. Everything is darkness. Everything is hidden. But something has just been revealed. Something has just been lightened, in a sense, to him. He didn't understand up until that point the effect that the veil has on others because he didn't see it in himself. He didn't, you know, get dressed that Sunday morning and look in a mirror. This is the first time. And he sees what everybody else sees. And he rushes out into the darkness. Next day, a whole village talks about crazy Parson Hooper. Okay? So then we're going to skip some. Who comes to him the next day? Elizabeth, his fiance. What does she say? You don't have to explain it. You don't have to tell me what it means. But you have to do one thing. Then you only have to do it once. Lift the veil so I can see your face. One time. And I'll marry you. And we'll live, well, maybe not quite happily ever after, but we'll live ever after. And he says, no. He says, bottom of 335. In paragraph 25. Paragraph 26, she looks at him and she says, there's nothing terrible about this piece of crape, this black veil, except it hides a face I'm always glad to look upon. Let the sun shine from behind the cloud. Symbolism, his face is the sun to her. The cloud is the veil. Remove it. Okay. First lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. And he says, there is an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crepe till then. What's the veil he's talking about then? It's a different meaning. It's not any of the ones we've seen. It's not death. What's the veil then? This flesh. There's an hour to come when we will die. And this, this veil that hides what is inside will die. Why do we say it hides what is inside? What's a body without a soul, so to speak, if you believe in souls? What's a body without a soul? Empty. Louder? Empty. Empty. Keep going. Dead. <laughs> There's nothing living there, right? If I were to suddenly drop dead right now, could you literally say that's Ted Sherman? No. You could say that was. Because <laughs> the Ted, I do believe in a soul, the Ted Sherman is no longer there. It's left the building, you know, so to speak. That's his point. Okay? But he says... I will never take the veil off <clears throat> until death. Your words are a mystery too. In other words, I, what do you mean? And I think she means both. What, do you, what, what veil are you talking about now? And uh, explain. Take away the veil from them. Make clear what you are saying. You're speaking in parables, is what she's saying. Tell me what you mean. And he says, I will. Paragraph 30. So far as my vow makes... What vow? Did he stand up before the congregation and say, I have made a vow. 
We didn't. Who do you make a vow to? Someone you love? Something you love? If you're a minister, I don't care what religion, if you're a minister, what at least is, or who at least, is the recipient of one of your vows? Your God, whatever that God may be, okay? Know then, this veil is, and then he brings in two other terms. A type and a symbol. A type is a... I really wanted to finish this today. Is a prefiguring. It's like a foreshadowing. So, for example... Use the Old Testament. When, when Jesus came in the New Testament, he said, search the scriptures and see what they say about me. Why? Because he's saying, I am there all throughout the Old Testament. How? Because there are types of Jesus. Types. David. Okay. Samson. Even though he went and screwed around to Delilah and all that kind of stuff, he is a type. How? What did Samson do for the Jewish people against the Philistines? He delivered them. He redeemed them. Moses, probably the greatest type, who was the deliverer of the Hebrews from bondage in Egypt. And there are multiple levels of meaning there because Egypt is... Literally a land, but figuratively, metaphorically, it is what? It is a state of being. Bondage to sin. And he delivered them. And St. Paul, man, he just goes back and forth. Jesus is the great deliverer. He's the redeemer. He takes us out of the land of sin into the promised land, all nine yards. But they're types. They're not, you know instances of Jesus being alive then. Why? Moses never goes into the promised land. He sees it, but he doesn't get to go in. Because none of them, none of these types from the Old Testament are Jesus. Okay? But he says it's a type and it's a symbol. It suggests, it points to something. Does he say what it is a type in symbol of. And I'm bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, in solitude and before the gaze of multitudes. As with strangers, so with my familiar friends. No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. I mean, he means like when I take a bath, guess what? I'm still wearing it. When I sleep, I'm wearing it. The dismal shade Dismal literally means shady, not clear, somewhat hidden. Must separate me from the world, even you, Elizabeth. His future wife, you can't come behind it. So, assume for a moment they do get married. What's he saying? Even when we are making love, I'm wearing that she's like, forget it, man. Oh, nope, ain't gonna do it. What grievous, what has happened to you? Notice, something caused this to happen, she suggested. If it be a sign of mourning, so type, symbol, now sign. A sign refers to one thing, like allegory. If it be a sign of mourning, Notice this is a conditional. If, it might not be, I, perhaps like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a veil. If it's a sign of mourning, guess what? I've got sorrows in my past. That can be typified. That can be demonstrated by a veil. She said, but what if what if the people out there don't believe it's an innocent symbol? What if they think it hides some dark, secret sin? What was his first sermon about? 
after putting on the veil. Secret sin. She says, people love and respect you, but there will be whispers. He's hiding something. Maybe we should read Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. You know. And he says, if I hide my face for sorrow, there is cause enough. If I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? If this is my visual representation of my secret sin, he's saying everyone can wear one of these. Okay? And she leaves. But just before she does, she looks at him, top of 336. This is paragraph 36. We're told. Tears rolled down her face. And then, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil. Then, when, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors fell around her. In other words, she metaphorically feels like she has a veil on. And she stands trembling. And he says, now you understand, don't you? He doesn't say that literally. He says, and do you feel it then at last? What's the it? It isn't answered. Why? It's a parable. You got to figure it out. She makes no replies, but covers her eyes with her hand. Her hand, therefore, becomes what? veil. She can't bear to see it. Because the it is like a mirror. Reflecting what? Something inside her. And she, just before she leaves, lift the veil but once. And look me in the face. And he says, can't be. And she leaves. Okay? Three minutes, we can finish. Because we're going to skip the rest of his life. He goes on, and people far and wide come to listen to his sermons. I mean, he goes from being a middle of the road, kind of eh, average preacher, to you know, like people are almost willing to pay good money to come listen to him. And he's on his deathbed. And the minister of Westbury comes in, and says, Venerable, this is page 338, paragraph 50. Venerable Father Hooper, venerable, worthy of being venerated. Okay? Father Hooper. The Puritans didn't call any minister father. Why? Because Jesus says, call, call no man father. All right? The moment of your release is you're about to die. Are you ready for the lifting of the veil that shuts in time from eternity? That is death. And he says, Yay! My soul is a patient weariness until that veil be lifted. A patient and enduring tiredness. And he says, Then it's only right and appropriate that a man of such great prayer, such blameless example, holy indeed in thought, should go you know, without burdens into the great beyond. Lift the veil. And he reaches forward to Parson Hooper, who's in his bed, and he reaches forward to lift the veil so he can see Parson Hooper's face. So that when Parson Hooper dies, he'll die facing Jesus. And Jesus will be able to see him for God. You know. And Parson Hooper leans up he grabs the veil and says, never. Now listen to the minister of Westbury. Dark old man. Dark, hidden, secretive, etc. What are you hiding, you know? With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? And he says, he replies, why do you tremble at me alone? Why are you guys scared to death by looking at me? 
Tremble also at each other. Have men avoided me, women shown no pity, children screamed and fled, only for my black veil. What but the mystery which it obscurely, hiddenly, darkly typifies has made this piece of crepe so awful. It's just a piece of fabric. When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, the lover to his best beloved, when man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, loathsomely treasuring up his secret, the secret of his ends, then, when these three things happen, then deem me a monster. For the symbol beneath which I have lived and died, I look around me and lo, on every visage a black veil. Now, literally, yeah, he could kind of see that. He means it figuratively. How does everyone wear a black veil. We'll address that briefly. What day is today? Today's Wednesday. On Friday. Um, and we'll do uh, Faulkner's Burn Burning. Um, you've got a quiz. Remember the extra credit quiz. It's due tomorrow night by 11.59. I'm going to put up another quiz. Question, what is the question? Literary terms, the literary terms for fiction. It's on D2L. Um, I'm going to put up another quiz probably today that'll be over more, maybe some of the same, literary terms and the story. Okay? Uh, it'll probably be due Saturday or Sunday, something like that. You said Faulkner's what? On Friday, we're reading Faulkner's. Uh, Barn Burning. Barn Burning. Barn Yep. Stop.